Well, my name is Sarah Casada. I am an assistant professor in the Department of English, and uh, it is uh, September 17th, 2018, and I am thrilled to have Achi Ovejas with us today. Um, she will be spending uh, today, will be her public lecture, and then tomorrow we'll be visiting a couple of classes, so we were just thrilled that we were able to steal her away from California. Um, to to bring her back home to the Midwest. The Midwest. So welcome. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much for being here. I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> um, so I have a range of questions. Uh, I have to uh, admit there are perhaps more questions on ruins uh, in here than, than on the rest of, of your work, but uh, and nevertheless there's questions about a variety um, uh, of your work and then also uh, pertaining to politics, sexuality, and things like that. So I'll just just go right into it. That's yeah, okay. I'm ready for you. Great. All right. <laughs> so autobiography. Uh, you often talk about that because your first novel, for instance, and also you know, we came all the way from Cuba, so you could dress like this. Um, have you know a young woman that left Cuba at a young age, uh, attempting to recover, you know, the memory of Cuba. That people read it as autobiographical mm -hmm. when it really isn't. Um, that you pull from autobiography, but it's mm -hmm. not all that you know biographical. Can you say a little bit more now about your newest book, A Tower of the Antilles, especially when it comes to the images by uh, Nat Natalie Catasus, I believe, mm -hmm. and also the installation of Cho, um, that inspired the work. I think that was also mentioned, I know of Humberto Sanchez, who was mm -hmm. a Cuban exile that was doing uh, sort of memorials mm -hmm. of those that fled Cuba. Yeah, I think most writers pull from their own lives. I don't think any, I do, I'm doing anything mysterious. I think. Uh, you know, things happen to us or things spark us in some way mm -hmm. and we go down that route. You know, you don't write about what you're not interested in. You don't write about what doesn't motivate you or move you or compel you or, or disturb you or in some way, uh, you know, get under your skin. Um, I think, um, I, you know, I was always really curious with my first book, for example, that it was always being referred to as autobiographical stories, and, and, and in fact, uh, I think Publishers Weekly referred to it as autobiographical essays, which was really fascinating. I was like, <laughs> what? That, what? Um, because those were seven stories that had very distinctly different uh, narrators. They were, I think, all first person, but, you know, one was a white guy, you know, the, every single, every single, uh, story in which there was a young woman, uh, they were not Cuban, they were, uh, you know, Mexican or Puerto Rican or something, and I think it's only the last story that's very clearly uh, Cuban and sort of hues closer to my own uh, life experience, the title story. Um, so I think it's a matter, you know, it's, it's convenient for some critics to sort of automatically, you know, attach that to what people write um, and, and to you know, it's, I think it's, it's, it's convenient and it's, and it's a little bit lazy because then they can sort of interpret according to these autobiographical, you know, boundaries or, you know, limitations that, you know, they, they already have in mind about, you know, who you are and what your life is like, you know. And the, the Wikipedia entry becomes part of the literary criticism, which is, I think, unfortunate. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Well, and, and can you tell us a little bit more about the, those images that inspire the Tower of the Antilles? I know that they might have come from, uh, in part, from a student that you were working with, right? That she was working on this project mm -hmm. and it sort of... Uh, yeah, that was inspired. a secondary part. Um, I wrote the title story, The Tower of the Antilles, in a kind of a fever. I couldn't really tell you where that came from. Uh, for a long time it was a story that didn't sound like any other story I'd ever written. In fact, I didn't think it was a story. I thought it was a poem. I thought it was a long prose poem. And uh, I didn't know what to do with it. It didn't really fit in anything I was doing. Uh, but it felt powerful to me and very interesting in its sort of evocation of the island and this notion of, you know, Babel and, you know, chaos. Um, also, I wrote it in Spanish and then translated it into English. It wasn't the first story I'd written in Spanish by any stretch, but it, it, I have a different voice in Spanish uh, than I do in English. And I think probably that, that's in part because even though I'm fully bilingual and I'm conversationally very comfortable in both languages, my formal education is English. And so I tend to feel much more confident in my ex experimentation. 
when it comes to English, and I'm much more, uh, I don't want to say cautious, but I'm much more deliberate in Spanish in a particular way. Um, and, you know, I, th this thing was just something I was kind of holding on to, and I didn't know quite what to make of it. And then Natalie Gethasus showed up one day in my office. Um, I teach at Mills College. She was going to the California College of the Arts, and she asked me to be a thesis advisor for her. And she had this crazy project about this guy, Humberto Sanchez, who she never met, I've never met. We can't seem to find anybody who's ever met this guy. He's disappeared. He's just kind of vanished in thin air. And, you know, Humberto Sanchez is like a Joe Smith. You know, he could be, you know, you, you can't really Google, you know. Mm -hmm. um, huh. and, uh, and it was a beautiful and very sad, you know, project about these boats that were just floating up on the shores of South Florida, but they were empty. These were the people who didn't make it. These were the people coming from Cuba or Haiti or any other place in the Caribbean, really. Um, she didn't presume that they were all coming from Cuba, and apparently neither did Sanchez. But the, 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 the notion was that Sanchez started collecting these boats and uh, thought that they merited uh, some sort of you know, official recognition and to, and to talk about uh, the people who didn't make it to talk about the the risks and the 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 many lost souls between you know South Florida and the and the rest of the Caribbean, and he could never get any kind of sponsorship. He could never um, get any support for this. It does go against the you know the, a lot of the self-image that Cuban Americans have. You know, they're triumphant. They make it. They arrive and they and they recreate and and reinvent themselves from nothing. The notion that there are so many people who've just never made it is kind of counterintuitive to the the, the Cuban refugee myth of triumph. You know, triunfalismo. We're very attached to that notion. I think more than 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 most people. And uh, anyway, he eventually just destroyed all these. He had he had collected literally hundreds of these boats. At one point, he actually apparently had, you know, rented an airplane hangar and just had boats and other, you know, skiffs and kayaks and, you know, anything that would float that would then come up on the, on, on the beaches. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, eventually he destroyed all these things. There is a, there is a story in the, in the Miami Herald about his collection. Mm -hmm. But um, he did hand some over to um, a museum in Key West. And the museum set them in the back, and so there, you know, you there's no signage that leads you back there. There's nothing. They're just in the backyard, and they're literally just disintegrating. They are, they're just turning into dust back there. They're, um, and it is a very moving, but a very very sad experience to walk among these boats. It's almost like walking among coffins, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and to touch them and to smell them and to uh, uh, look at the, the tiny details of, of, you know, the wear and tear on the boats and, you know, uh, it was really sort of extraordinary. And I remember after the, the first or second meeting that we had, I, I cranked out uh, the collector and then I, I realized that it had a bunch of stuff in common with uh, the Tower of the Antilles. So I actually brought them back in a double screen and I played with them and then I, and then I borrowed language from the Tower of the Antilles to right. make the linkage more obvious. Uh, they serve as bookends. The yeah, and they serve as bookends, right. What is your name? Right. Yeah, exactly, right. that's what I figured. Um, Oh, I also wanted to ask, from the Tower Antilles, is there a story from that collection that is more personal to you for certain reasons? Kimberly okay. is definitely a, How so? <laughs> a, a very personal story. Uh, it's not autobiography in that strict sense, but uh, I went to school in Bloomington, Indiana, and I know those back roads really well, and I did that crazy driving with the lights off and uh, um, 
and I, I did have a kind of a chaotic and uh, sexy and uh, incorrigible roommate <laughs> uh, uh, named Kimberly. And uh, it, in, a, in a way, it's sort of a little homage to her. I don't know where she is. I have no idea where mm -hmm. she is in the world. But uh, I loved her a lot. I thought she was uh, uh, just a very special soul. Maybe she'll come up. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. I, I don't. The, the I don't think of her as a great reader. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's funny because I wrote that story in Havana. It's it's the most Midwestern story I've written in years, if not ever. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and I and I wrote it in Havana. It was an incredibly hot uh, summer, and. Uh, I remember just sitting uh, at my desk and just dripping sweat, just like literally just rivers of sweat. Uh, nothing was, you know, we, the n electricity wasn't working, we, we didn't have a fan, and I, just drinking gallons of water while writing that story. And, um, and I, would, I would write and then I would read it aloud and then I would, uh, you know, the, the real question for me on that story was what tense is it, you know, is it in past tense, is it in present tense, you know, because the story feels urgent to me. Um, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and also realizing that I was writing a story in a language that determined an audience that knew nothing about what I was writing about uh, in terms of setting and in terms of, uh, you know, certain conducts and things like that. So it was, it's, it, was also, it was also strange because I love to write with the internet available to me because I, I, I love to jump in and, and like find weird connections with things and, um, and you know, sometimes... Cuba, that wasn't... <laughs> well, I mean, you know, there's a lot of stuff about Alfredo Colonna, the, the aerialist in, in that piece. And, uh, and I, I remember, like just putting X's on things because I knew I would have to go back and and <laughs> fill it with, <laughs> with information I didn't, you know, details, specific details I didn't have, and uh, and then at some point I, I said no 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 I you know, it, the, there was a time when the internet didn't exist mm -hmm. I I'm gonna I'm gonna make it work and I and I wrote the whole thing without looking anything up. Well, so thinking of, of you know the, of temporality and maybe the existence of internet, maybe its non-existence when you were starting to you know you were publishing some of your first works, because um, I think a lot about the evolution of an author, uh -huh. and uh, and when I think about you know we came all the way from Cuba or Memory Mambo, your first works, um, and your latest, The Tower of the Antilles, I can't help thinking about the malleability and the perfect nature of memory. Which is, you know, the theme of memory right. is. Uh, it's I think, a constant. Yeah, it's a constant. I think in, in your work. So, mm -hmm. for instance, I think about um, Juani and how she relies on her family to turn memory into truth, you know, and uh, she wants to come to a consensus on memory, whereas the Tower of the Antilles proposes more like fractured memories in a sense. So, um, I wonder if you can speak to this evolution of if you if you how you view view yourself in terms of this evolution as an author how do you feel like you've changed thinking about these works and the tower of the antilles and and this aspect of mem how has the malleability of memory changed for you if, if at all well i think it's less about the malleability of memory changing than about my relationship to that malleability changing you know i think when i first started writing and i think it's very clear memory mambo you know there was a a real desire to get at the truth, you know. Um, I have a long, uh, you know, I have a long relationship with journalism, and journalism sort of pretends to 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 have a way into, you know, the facts, the way things really happened. And, you know, when you're a kid, when you're a a, a kid who goes through dislocation and displacement like I did, and where the family is completely separated from place of origin. Mm -hmm. Because I think this is one of the things that, that is particular about Cubans and other people who are exiles rather than mere immigrants. You know, when you're an immigrant, you make a decision about coming here. 
and for the most part that decision is is forward looking you know it's it, this is the new thing this is the new life I mean the decision may be coerced but you're still making a decision to to come you know but I think exile is different because it, you know both you and the place you're from agree that you're not going back and and I think exile is bittersweet because it's not so forward looking it's I think there's a lot of looking back at what might have been not so much what was I think that's what's really fascinating it's not so much what was but what might have been there's always this tinge of of the lost possibilities in the stories that come from exiles and you know and I say that not just in terms of you know my own experience with my family but just listening to other people who've you know, gone into exile and, and, and hearing them talk about uh, their home countries and, you know, it, 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 there's always this, um, you know, it isn't this rose-colored glasses kind of thing. There's a, there's a, there's a real, you know, blue sadness, you know, there's a real, there's, there's a real sort of midnight to to the memories but I um like what could have been had you stayed in Cuba yeah I think there's a lot of that and I think and I think that affects other people as well but I think you know like I said at the beginning I, I very much wanted to get at the truth I wanted to know what was really behind them because a lot of things my parents told me just seemed fantastic it seemed you know impossible to imagine here in my you know first world existence you know but I think you know, two things happened. I think one is I went back to Cuba and I realized, oh my God, my parents actually, you know, have no idea how nuts it really is. You know, it's a, it's a place that's almost phantomagorical. You know, it's a, the things that happen there, uh, the way that that life functions because the the societal structures are, are so absurd. Uh, you know, like your driver being a spy. Yeah, like my driver being a spy, or, you know, that that uh, in order to get water in your cistern you have to you know bribe the water truck guy uh, not with money but with a bag of cement you know or whatever else he needs or you know uh, that you know I have a friend who's a, a dishwasher at a restaurant in order to get that job she had to marry one of the owners because the rules around employment in family-owned restaurants in Cuba is that everybody has to be related. So, you know, she's a dishwasher, mm -hmm. but in order to get that job, she had to marry, you know, this guy. And of course, it's a complete sham marriage. I mean, they don't behave in any way as, as, as husband and wife, but it's, it, it's a legal arrangement that sort of forced the issue. You know, um, I, I have another friend who's a taxi driver and he's got a, 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 a 1957 Ford. And I remember he, he got in an accident, and in order to uh, have his insurance be viable, he had to find the original owner of the car, who of course had left the country. So the whole thing was just this maddening experience. You know, you just go on these like crazy rabbit hole, uh, you know, situations yeah. all the time in Cuba. But I think I think what 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 happened was, you know, going there, seeing that, but also realizing that sometimes the truth doesn't matter at all. That sometimes uh, the truth is sort of beside the point. Um, that there's, there's something else at play. You know, um, when I, on one of my very first trips to Cuba, um, one of my cousins put into doubt uh, my father's law degree. Um, and I was really perplexed by this uh, because his whole life he'd, you know, been, you know, when I was a lawyer or, you know, as a lawyer, you know, <laughs> and he, he was rather adamant about, you know, having this degree and, and uh, you know, he was a high school teacher, but he forced everybody to call him, you know, Dr. Obejas based on his PhD from the University of Havana, presumably this law degree. And I, yeah, I think if I'd been younger, I would have come home and confronted my dad and asked him to tell me the truth about that. But I came home and I realized um, he's so invested in that. That's so who he is. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and it's not like he's practicing law and breaking the law or anything like that. You know, he's, this is about, it, you know, his self-image, who he is, what he thinks of himself. This is what holds him up, what gets him through the day. It doesn't yeah, and I, and I felt like, I don't care. It doesn't matter whether he was a lawyer or not. He thinks he was, and uh, it, it's, it, it fuels him in some way to, to think of himself that way, and I'm not going to get in the way of that. As it turned out, he is—he was a lawyer, but we, we really, my brother and I were both mystified for, for years. We had no, no real clue. He didn't get a chance to practice very much, and I think because he, he got his law degree very, very late. And, uh, and, then, and then migrated. And then, yeah, and then we, we fled Cuba. So uh, in, in some ways, he wasn't a lawyer. You know, it's all a formality. Um, but it just didn't seem worth it to me to to confront him. I also, you know, I remember a little incident with my mom when she was, I, I, I ended up spending a tremendous amount of time in Havana, even living there for part of the time during the, the early aughts. And um, my mom made a reference to something and she referred to an intersection and I realized those streets actually did not intersect. And uh, I, you know, I could see my 20 something self saying, me, 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 me. You know, but again, it, her. and it and it just seemed not worth it. You know, it's like there was what was the point of undermining her? You know, and I and you know it flashed. This a, was a street in Cuba. The, yeah, this was an intersection in Havana. Okay. Yeah, where she hadn't been in years. You know, in like 30, 40 some odd years. Um, and you know, it's perfectly reasonable that she would have memory failure. But also, it was interesting because I I know that when it happened, I. I thought it, and I, I know that I, I gave it away in my eyes or something, and she saw that I saw, and oh. that I, and and we both kind of like moved away from it, you know. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, and it, and it was it is it was particularly interesting because we're not a family that walks away from stuff. We we actually walk right into stuff. <laughs> it's, it's like our favorite activity, you know. Boom, you know, um, but. I think I became more tolerant of these, uh, of these moments where there was There's a lack of precision, but that the emotional weight of the moment, you know, completely overwhelmed uh, any need to be precise. And there's a fondness of that memory, right? And sometimes when that, that memory seems so so marvelous and you know you want to leave it at that too. yeah I just yeah like, why, why bother I mean you know what harm does it do right exactly well and speaking of so speaking of the marvelous especially after all you know all these descriptions of Cuba that that you you know just made I, it's it's interesting because I when I think of your work I think about the Carpentarian lo real maravilloso I think about the marvelous real you know right and and you once uh, mentioned uh, when you were talking about days of awe how this particular book paid tribute to influential Cuban writers, you know, mm -hmm. Maria Loinas, Guillén, Lesama Lima, Cabrera Infante. Um, Cristina but that, Garcia. Cristina Garcia. Yeah. That you, but that you needed a vehicle, a, another vehicle for, for somebody like Carpentier. And I wonder whether you haven't achieved that already with a Tower novel like Ruins or Tower of the Antilles. Tower of the Antilles. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I... <laughs> you know, I mean, it, or, and how does Lo yeah. Real Maravilloso influence you? Uh, yeah. Well, I love the whole notion of Lo Real Maravilloso. I mean, um, I'm not that fond of magic realism, but I love Lo Real Maravilloso. Um, and I, I sort of, I like that it's more subtle and that it actually goes to not the invention of what's not there, but the sort of appreciation of what is there, and that what is there is kind of unbelievable. <laughs> That's right. um, and, and, and I think in the Caribbean, that's true both of the natural world and of the human-made world, you know, where a lot of times you're just going, whoa, <laughs> really? <laughs> um, and like too incredible for it to be possible. Yeah, too incredible for it to be possible. Yeah. You know, um, and I've I've come to really appreciate apocryphal stories and 
you know, rumor <laughs> and, and things like, totally counterintuitive to all of my training as a, as a journalist. Um, I, you know, ruins actually it is more about Hemingway, really, in terms of structure and in, ter in terms of inspiration than it is about Carpentier. Um, I am actually someone who really appreciates Hemingway's craft and uh, his, uh, yeah, again, you know, incredible precision. And um, I, I love the the whole tip of the iceberg thing and how and how so much is unsaid mm -hmm. in um, in his work. Um, I think culturally, you know, Cubans really pride themselves on being, you know, straightforward and, you know, we don't mess around with this psychological stuff, we just tell it like it is, but in, in truth is, in truth we, there's a lot unsaid, you know, we spend a lot of time not saying, whether it's, you know, not mentioning Fidel's name and going like this instead or, <laughs> or you know, or it's talking about things in code and uh, both because of the paranoia of of this, you know, that that's sort of inherent to the system there, um, and 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 bred very, you know, vigorously, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but also because um, I think we actually don't have a vocabulary for talking about certain things that are really hard. You know, it, it, you know, post-revolution, for example. It, it became really, really difficult in Cuba to talk about racism, which is a very powerful silence when you think about the fact that Cuba is an African diaspora country and that almost everyone in Cuba has some racial mixture. Mm -hmm. um, not everyone, but almost everyone. And, you know, that any given family has a rainbow of color and, uh, you know, these very complex, uh, you know, kinships um, and, and Cubans are also very good about sort of creating family out of nothing. I mean, I have a gazillion cousins that have no blood ties to me whatsoever. Um, and, and they feel like cousins to me. They're not friends. They're, they really are cousins, you know. Um, but um, when, you know, we, we stopped talking about racism because Fidel Castro stood up one day in 1961 and said, there, we've eliminated it, we've eliminated racism. And so, not, so to talk about racism became counter-revolutionary. To say this incident happened and it was a racist incident uh, was essentially to accuse someone of being counter-revolutionary, to be behaving in a way that was impossible, supposedly, within the constraints of this new society. So what happens is that, of course, racism exists because we're imperfect and we're human and we have a colonial history and we have a, you know, a super late history of, of slavery, uh, one of the last countries in the Western Hemisphere to get rid of slavery. Um, and of course, there is tremendous disparate you know, economic conditions for people of color in Cuba versus white people, and not just pre-revolution, but also post-revolution. You know, the, the, the Central Committee was all white men until the 21st century. Um, you know, the, the, the first ever black president of the National Assembly, uh, you know, is Mario Lasso, nominated by Raul Castro after Fidel, after Obama, yeah. you know. So, uh, you know, of course these things uh, exist, but there was no way to talk about it until you know, very early 21st century, when Roberto Retamar from Casa de las Americas decided to talk about it and said, we still have a ways to go with this. Right. And then right. once Retamar sort of opened the, 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 the conversation, then Fidel could say, you know, we, we, we tried really hard, we wanted to, but we didn't. And then suddenly you see uh, in official spaces uh, the possibilities of talking about racism and actually talking about notions of privilege which is so often attached in discussion to issues of economic influence or power. And in Cuba, that's not how it works because nobody has economic power or influence. Mm -hmm. You have influence and power through other means. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we, we have to learn these new things. Our societies are affected in different ways. You know, I remember when, when Havel became president for the first time in Czechoslovakia, he gave this tremendous speech in which he talked about how
one of the most important things that had to happen was that the, the people of Czechoslovakia would have to learn to talk to each other about all the things that they hadn't talked about oh, wow. during all the years of the, the, the Soviet uh, presence. Uh, and it's a, it's, a very, um, it's a very touching but very powerful speech about Catharsis. the silences. Yeah, about the silences that we, we learn and, and keep and don't question, you know. Well, if racism can, uh, racism being and confronting that in Cuba can be one of the aspects of sort of engaging with, you know, it can be a silence that you hope to engage with through your through your fiction and through your writing. I wonder if the normalization of non heteronormativity is another one because I think of, well, and because I think of, for instance, I think of Days of Awe, um, where the Spanish Inquisition's presence and it's affecting you know, crypto Jew communities having to mm -hmm. refuge themselves in Catholicism is of particular importance. Um, but I find that the Inquisition is such a fascinating point of departure in this novel, um, especially as it relates to maybe uh, ruins to a certain extent, because in ruins you have Jacinto, who is this very important uh, figure mainly because he goes to Angola and reports on non-heteronormative practices, behavior, and just beingness, mm -hmm. but reports it back to the main character, Usnavi, and, uh, and only has that experience because he was in Angola. And Angola happens to be this region where the Inquisition was highly present in the 16th century onwards. And uh, you know, there are cases in the Inquisition that show that um, you know, uh, slaves that had been captured, they were, you know, uh, they were accused of sodomy, right. and you know, and then and then later it just came out that that they said, well, no, I'm you know, I'm not, you know, having sex with other males. It's just that I am both. I'm bigendered, right? And uh, and so obviously the Inquisition, there was there was no tolerance for this kind of, you know, ideal and uh, this kind of beingness, and and they and they tried to crush it. But what is so fascinating about ruins is that you have somebody like Jacinto that goes to Angola in the 1970s, comes back to Cuba to share it with Usnavi, and so it's not only resisting coloniality and the revolutions and tolerance right. to non-heteronormativity, he's it's also trans it's also traversing the Atlantic. So right. I wonder if for you this aspect of uh, non-heteronormativity can be normalized if we saw it more as a shared global reality and less of a, say, a U.S. leftist political talking point? Or Well, how? short answer, yes. But I, I think also it's very important when it comes to this notion of heteronormativity in Cuba to understand that the Cuban Revolution, for all of its very progressive positions and policies on many important aspects of society, was actually incredibly conservative when it came to sex and family. Mm -hmm. You know, pre-revolution, Cuba was a very libertine place, and in fact, through all of its colonial history, Cuba was a very libertine place. Um, the entire city of Havana was excommunicated at one point in the 17th century because there was so much crazy sex and, you know, revelry going on, uh, you know. And, it, and if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Here is a small island that serves as the key of, for the empire to the rest of its holdings in the Americas. You know, no Spanish ship came to the Americas without making a pit stop in Cuba. It was, you know, it, it was the truck stop. That, you know, the world's largest truck stop. <laughs> and, uh, like you know, every ship before. came through refreshed, you know. And of course, you know, who's on those ships? It's men. Men are on those ships. Um, at one point, the, the male-female ratio, you know, of the city of Havana was so crazy lopsided. Um, it was something like, you know, four to one or something like that. Uh, in terms of you know men, there were so many more men than there were uh, women. Um, even the clerical presence was overwhelmingly male. We didn't have nuns until very very late in Cuba. Mm -hmm. So here is a place that has all these official policies, but the reality of the situation um, is that it doesn't function that way. You know, again, you know, Cuba. Santiago had a, a, a seat 
of, of the, was one of the many seats of the Inquisition. And at one point, you know, they, they took it away from Santiago and they, they, you know, gave the seat to the Dominican Republic. Why? Well, because Cubans were reporting that they, oh, yeah, 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 we burned that guy at the stake, no worries. And then, you know, six months later, that guy would be walking around in the streets of Havana perfectly fine because he bribed his way out of it, you know. Uh, nobody really cares, resistance. you know. You know I, I think it was less resistance than corruption, you know. Uh, I mean, I'm not advocating that he should have been burned at the stake, but I think, you know, this, this legacy of, of, yeah. of corruption and this legacy of tolerance of, 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 you know, breaking the law and many of the things that we consider vice, uh, you know, things of that nature is, is very much embedded in this colonial history and yeah. sort of, you know, you know, spills into the years of the Republic. And um, so Cuba, prior to the revolution, was, you know, known as the brothel of, of, of the Caribbean. It was this place where no, known for, you know, not just legalized prostitution, but very specialized legalized prostitution. You know, the, the city of Caimanera, right next to the base, to Guantanamo base, um, had 900 brothels, which is, which is nuts, you know? Um, and obviously, when you have that kind of tolerance for, um, you know, I mean, they had sex shows, they had live sex shows. You know, the Shanghai Theater was a 24-hour live you know, and film, you know, porno theater. And you, know, you could just as easily go see, uh, you know, a film or see a, a show or, you know, or, or participate in a show because uh, some, of the, some of the acts would, would ask people in the audience if they wanted to volunteer for this or that. So that kind of ambience also is not going to be shocked or amazed by the presence of gay people. And in fact, in a weird way, it created a, a safe space for that. It, it wasn't shocking to be gay. I'm not saying that there was any kind of civil rights involved in, you know, the, the Cuban gay community pre-revolution, of course not. Mm -hmm. But there was a tremendous tolerance by virtue of the fact that there was, it was such a sexually tolerant place, mm -hmm. you know, that there were all these other interests at play. Mm -hmm. um, and so homosexuality kind of fell into that bag, even if you were the most, you know, banal homosexual, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know five other fags, you know, whatever, you know, it wasn't like a big, whoa. No. Um, and, you know, historically, you know, the, the Catholic Church has played a very strong role in Latin America, but not in Cuba. And, and it's always really hard to explain this to people, but um, it, yes, Cubans are nominally Catholic, but Santeria has been a very powerful force uh, since the introduction of slavery in Cuba. And as a result, you know, there's been a great deal more openness on these ideas of, of sexuality being a flexible you know, aspect of who we are as humans. I mean, keep in mind that in the pantheon of Santeria, the Orishas, the gods, change sex every six months, you know? <laughs> and that frequently, you know, the, the transformation of the Yoruba deities into Catholicized icons mm -hmm. don't necessarily follow gender. I mean, Chango is the most powerful of the gods, you know, this fiery black man, uh, and the god of thunder, and, he, and the Catholicized version of Chango is Santa Barbara, who's white, red-haired, you know, mm -hmm. female, mm -hmm. um, rides a white horse, <laughs> you know, wears a crown. Uh, mm -hmm. So, it, you know, it's complicated when all that stuff. So there was a certain tolerance about this kind of thing. The revolution actually is, comes in and is very conservative. Most of the, the, the thinking around a lot of this stuff comes from Fidel, who was educated in Jesuit schools, you know. Oh, interesting. Yeah, he was educated, in, and a lot of the comandantes were, and um, whose own approach to his, you know, famili familial life has been extraordinarily discreet. Um, I mean, he was with, with Dahlia for 28 years or something like that, 
and at the time of his death, and Cubans only found out about her like three or four years before he died. You know, um, Raul Castro separated from Vilma Espin almost 20, 30 years before she died, and yet the public perception of him is that they were married until the very end. He was with someone else. He has children with someone else. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's common knowledge, but yet the official version is that they stayed married. Um, so this very sort of conservative approach to what is family, what's not family. Um, and, and it set back, I think, a lot of things in terms of, uh, of, of the possibilities of gay people. You know, I think that, that it, it's, it's a little bit of like what happened with talking about race, you know. Um, that gay people didn't exist, so therefore we can't talk about it. <laughs> Didn't exist, and uh, you know, and then there was that notorious period in the in the late '60s when uh, Raúl went to Bulgaria and uh, you know asked where where are your you know where are your homosexuals and they said well we <laughs> we kill them and um, and he came back thinking well let's we need to do something with ours because we have too many you know. Effeminate men, I guess, is what they were after, and they created these the 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 U maps, the units for military, whatever it is that the rest of that was, um, and which were essentially uh, they weren't concentration camps. People often refer to them as concentration camps, and I always find that slightly offensive. But um, they were labor camps, and they were re you know reeducation and indoctrination camps mm -hmm. to uh, essentially transform, convert homosexuals into heterosexuals, and of course, you know, it, none of that ever works. <laughs> so, um, uh, and, and, there, and the, a lot of the eyewitness testimony about this, these places are, are rather surreal. Um, you know, they were, they actually in many ways helped form community, you know. But, but also that particular generation of people who were affected by the UMAPs, the people who, who were either sent to the UMAPs or who feared being sent to the UMAPs, um, is a very, very damaged uh, generation of, of, of queer people. They, you know, they were, they tended to be turned in by other queers. Uh, they were very susceptible to, you know, blackmail uh, because, you know, if you were found out to be queer, you couldn't be this or you couldn't be that. You know, you, you couldn't go to university, you couldn't have particular jobs, you couldn't be teachers, you couldn't handle, and you couldn't be in any kind of position that engaged children in any way. Um, if you if you really think about that, that that eliminates a lot of things, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, these are these are people who, uh, you know, are, are kind of lost souls in a lot of ways. When you reimagine Reynaldo Arenas in ruins, he he seems to if if one can read it, one can read Reina in the Solution. Um, <laughs> when he comes back to Cuba, though, he comes back sort of. She comes back reborn. Mm -hmm. She comes. She comes through this transition. Goes, but has to go to the United States for this kind of transition, and that really weighs on Navi, the main protagonist here in ruins. Yeah. And, and he sees her as something about how she transcends the real, and that's an inspiration for him, isn't it? Right. I mean, he ends up sort of embracing this idea of of being able to be. You know, being able to to redeem, to to trans, to to over to overcome, um, and I think that did happen. I think when I'll, when especially after the Maria Alexis, which had an overrepresentation of gay people, because you know that particular exodus happened. Uh, you know, they opened the 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 jails and sent forcibly sent people out of Cuba during that exodus. And a lot of queer people were in jail precisely because of their queerness, you know. Mm -hmm. It was considered unrevolutionary behavior. Um, and there was actually a law that, uh, the law of ostentatiousness, uh, that was used primarily against gay men, um, but obviously against anyone who, who was a little too effeminate or a little too masculine or a little you know, not conventionally heterosexual seeming. Mm -hmm. um, and so this exodus, you know, ended up 
uh, sending a lot of gay people to the United States, Cuban gay people to the United States. And here they discovered that they could lead a very open life compared to what they had experienced in Cuba. I'm not right. suggesting that this was the great nirvana, but certainly they were able to express themselves as queer people. They were able to, you know, go to a gay bar. You know, they were able to do these things, you know, have a job where everybody knew they were queer and wasn't, it didn't matter. Um, and, to hide it. right, and then in the 90s, um, a lot of Cubans go back during the special period. The government is sort of forced to, uh, to allow a much more, you know, open possibility of return because the Soviet Union collapsed, the economy collapsed, and suddenly Cuba needed tourist dollars uh, like nobody else, you know, like nothing. I mean, this was it. This was the only thing that, they, that would save them. And the, the most obvious community that would come and spend a lot of money was the Cuban American community. So a lot of those queer people returned to Cuba less about saying, screw you, than about seeing their family, seeing their friends or whatever, yeah. but undoubtedly, you know, in some case very willingly and in some case inadvertently also saying, screw you, you did that to me and look at me now, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm living my life. Yeah. Um, and it was, and, and yeah. it was very important. But having said that, I, I just want to point out two things. One, Reynaldo was, was the real Reynaldo Arenas. Uh, was absolutely masculine in his presentation and, and would have been horrified actually that I used a, 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 a transgender character to allude to him. He, he, was, uh, he was very put off by uh, the idea of, of being anything less than manly, and also hooking up with anyone who was less than manly, he oh. was he was very um, um, he didn't like the notion of of equality in his relationships with other men. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and he was a friend of mine. We had extended conversations about a lot of this crap, uh, and in a way, I kind of did it because I was kind of like, yeah. <laughs> um, but, and, but the other thing is that policy in Cuba has also changed dramatically. Um, uh, Mariela Castro, Raul Castro's daughter, is a sexologist, and she, um, she's a problematic figure in a lot of ways, but um, she founded the, the Sede Sex, which is the center for sex education in Cuba. And one of the things that the Sede Sex has managed to do is to really advocate for uh, transgender rights. And, so in Cuba, as a queer person, you have absolutely zero civil rights. But as a transgender person, you actually have some very progressive rights. You, you're, you're, if you choose uh, you know, any kind of, of, of trans surgery, it's covered by the Cuban National Health Plan. Um, and, if, and, you know, and the Cuban government recognizes your change of, of sex, there's, there's no debate or dispute in terms of your, uh, you know, identification, your national ID card, uh, you know, and so she's she's been a tremendous advocate for the trans community. I I find her problematic because um, she's she's not queer. She's a heterosexual woman, and but she very much, uh, you know, sort of sees herself as a leader in the you know, queer community. And I always find it problematic when someone who's not within the community mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, in a leadership role. I understand the importance of allies, and I think she is, has been a very critical ally. But, you know, whenever anybody starts disagreeing with her, you know, she, she sort of kicks them from the inner sanctum. And, uh, and it's very hard to have a, 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 any kind of, of gay activism in Cuba separate from Mariela's agenda and Mariela's groups. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it certainly has happened, but it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, switching gears just a little bit to talk a little bit more about, uh, well, who, a novel we've been talking about already, but uh, so it's not a secret that Ruins, for me, is my, is my favorite novel. <laughs> That, if not one of my favorite novels, one of your um, one of my favorite works of yours, um, and it reminds me, and I think the reason for this is that it reminds me of a Cortazian like novela total. You certainly have in this one novel uh, an example of world literature where you have contained not only Langston Hughes and Guillen, but also Franz Fanon, Wallace Soyinka, Chester Himes. Uh, you have the Serengeti, you have the Nile, you have Angola, you have Tiffany. 
So I was wondering if the, all these you know, are, are, are either symbols or were they obsessions or influences of a very specific time period in your life that informed the novel, or if they are symbols intended to change two things about Uznavi, uh, the course of his memory, but then also maybe a sense of futurity. Well, it's much more the latter. I mean, I certainly some of those writers that I mentioned, you know, are, are, are writers that have been influential to me. But, um, you know, it, they're in the novel because they're serving a symbolic purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, I'm a huge fan of Baldwin, but I, you know, his the, the very slight allusion to him in, in Ruins, uh, you know, is there because it serves a purpose to the story. You know, it's in service of the story. Mm -hmm. You know, I've read Suyinka, but I wouldn't. I would be very hesitant to uh, to to claim any influence from Sanka, but that great quote of his about the tiger not announcing his tigertude. Uh, I mean, oh my God, how can that's an irresistible quote, you know? Um, and it and, and it goes, uh, you know, so exactly to the center of. Of, of identity and about confidence in one's identity. I mean, of course the tiger doesn't announce his tigertude. You know, he's just busy being a tiger. Um, and, uh, and, but it's so obvious that it becomes a startling revelation when he says it. Um, so yeah, no, it's, it, what's there is in service to the story. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, nothing else, you know, I, I, you know I, I make a lot of literary allusions and in Days of Awe as well, and uh, you know, not everybody is somebody whom I necessarily favor. I mean, I I, I make a lot of reference to Les Amalima, mm -hmm. and I, I I feel this much influenced by Les Amalima, <laughs> and you know, I think he's kind of pesado. I mean, I I know that everything I'm saying is sacrilege to the Cuban literary universe, but I, you know, he doesn't do it for me. Oh, and, but but I but I recognize the incredible influence that he has and how important he is in Cuban letters and frankly in Latin American letters. Well, you I know? feel like that novel is doing those two things simultaneously. It's being, it's being reverent of these writers and these different periods in Cuban history at the same time that's being almost irreverent because it's saying, well, we can go beyond this. Of course. And, of and course. there's even a line in the novel that says that Uznavi goes beyond, right. you know, Guillén and Langston Hughes, <laughs> which I thought was brilliant. So. I wonder right. if that was sort of like a, a, a direction, if that is intentional or it, it, it was Navi who's this character who's often so frustrating, right. if, uh, if he can sort of be like this model for futurity, which I know sounds wild, but could be possible. Well, sure. I mean, the thing is that, you know, those people who stayed behind and sacrificed their entire, I mean, this is the thing, you know, my family left. Mm -hmm. and. I understand all the reasons why my family left, and I'm, you know, I, I think my parents had the best intentions in mind, and I'm frankly glad that we left because, as a pretty, you know, smart-mouthed queer girl, I don't know that I would have had a very, you know, easy life uh, in in Cuba. And the fact that they left also now allows me to go back in a position of of, of greater invulnerability to a lot of those things that actually, uh, you know, would have affected me if I'd stayed, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but those people who stayed behind, a lot of those people, that generation of six, the people who are lojitos right now, you know, I don't think of them as evil. I don't think of them as bad people. I think of them as actually really good people who really wanted something good and you know to happen not just in their country but in the world that you know this was their starting point this little island was the starting point and you know the utopia that they imagined and that they they were trying to conjure uh, was was a, a beautiful place you know it's hard to to you know dismiss the extraordinary generosity of those dreams and 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 the tragedy that it never had a chance mm -hmm. you know and it wasn't just because 
you know, the U.S. embargo and all. I mean, of course, all of those things are, are, you know, incredible factors in, in where we're at. But Cuba made terrible mistakes, and Cuba, you know, uh, didn't help itself, and, and the Cuban government has been corrupt in many ways. And I know that's not anything that uh, los cubanologos, you know, Yankee, Yuma, want to hear, but I, I think history proves my point. Uh, but those people, I think, are, are tragic. They gave their lives to this project that, that, um, that didn't turn out. And, um, and now they're kind of forgotten and marginalized. And I, I feel tremendous love for them. For somebody like Usnavi that then imagines Africa, imagines the Quiligon mass. I mean, where do these where do these images come from? And especially Badagri, Badagri, Nigeria, <laughs> which is a very important point on the slave trade route tourism circuit that you can now visit. Mm -hmm. uh, the African diaspora has, it, which rivals uh, almost uh, Gore Senegal or um, Elmina, Ghana. Where did where did Badagri emerge as a site of memory for you? Or just curious. Well, you know, once I started writing about uh, about Usnavi, who's a, a a kind of a complicated character because he, uh, you know, he presents as a kind of a white guy, but he's he's not at all, and 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 he has much closer ties to negritude than than uh, uh, you know seems uh, you know apparent at first. I I mean, I wanted him to be a little. Real Maravilloso, and you know he's a great reader. He, you know, he he reads a lot of Hemingway. Hemingway writes about Africa, a lot of, um, uh, you know, and and I think Cuba under the revolution has idealized Africa too. There's a there's a a very sort of fantastic sense of of Africa as this very powerful uh, place where. I mean, the, the, the one, one thing that the Cuban Revolution has done and has done, I think, pretty successfully, it's that it's pivoted our history from, you know, the Spanish Empire to Africa, you know, as points of, of, of great uh, influence and almost in a way as, as point of origin because uh, the indigenous population in Cuba is, is completely written out of history. Um, you know, the, the official position on the indigenous population is that there is no indigenous population. Yeah, I remember the first time I went to um, Oriente, and, uh, and it, it was crazy to me to see all these very dark people with very, very, very straight hair and aquiline noses. And I remember I called a friend of mine in, in uh, Havana, and I, it was like, Norbert, encontré los indios, you know? <laughs> I found, I found the indigenous population there in Santiago, <laughs> and, uh, and he was like, "What are you talking about?" And and all of these people that I had talked to anyway uh, identified as black, and I was like, "Really? This is wild to me." I mean, and it was clear that there was a lot of racial mixture, but it was also clear that 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 there was uh, an indigenous population, not culturally huh. indigenous in any way. I mean, that has been completely wiped out. You know, but um, but and so and so the, the the great place of of you know the origin imaginary has sort of pivoted to Africa. And this is because of 1975, the missions in Angola and, and all that, the Cuban Cuba being. Well, I think it's multiple. No, I, I mean I think that has certainly added to it, but I think it's 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 multiple. I mean, at the very beginning of the of the revolution, when the U.S. threatened the embargo before they. Um, the embargo was actually in place. The Cuban government actually uh, concocted a, a, a tourism campaign for African Americans, and they hired Joe Lewis as a as a spokesperson. And they um, they really um, saw themselves having a tremendous alignment with black people. I mean, remember Fidel stayed in Harlem, and you know at the Teresa Hotel, and um, you know Fidel you know, had instant solidarity with the liberation movements in Africa long before the, the, the you know, Cuban presence in, in, a, in Angola and uh, the, the many ways in which Cuba has engaged in, in Africa long before 
the 70s, I mean, in the, in the 60s, the, the way that, that uh, Fidel, you know, shifted Cuba, you know, into the non-alignment movement and into all of that, that was already creating uh, linkages and relationships with Africa that it was absolutely unprecedented in the history of, of Latin America, really, and certainly Cuba. And, um, and, and Africa became this, this sort of marvelous place. You know, this is, uh, you know, this was, I'm, it, this is where we came from and it was good. He says we're an Afro-Latin country as well. Right. In one of his speeches. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. Yeah, no, he, who is very white, uh, very much embraced the, the notion of Cuba as Afro-diasporic. Very interesting. Um, well, I wanted to also ask you about translation a little okay. bit, so um, if I may. So you've talked about how translating has been ingrained in you ever since you were a child, doing so for your parents, for instance, but how it also became an act by which you realized that Spanish can at times not be translated. It's ontology. It's, I think you call it saucy elasticity, <laughs> you called it at times. But I wonder whether the act of translating for you might also be a, a catharsis of sorts, um, as if you could cross into other cultural boundaries um, or maybe even bring, back, uh, be, bring you back from exile to a certain extent. Or how might it function for you? No, I think code switching does that for me, but not translation. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I love translation, and I particularly love translating Cuban authors um, because um, I love the way we talk. I, I think that Cuban Spanish, I mean, it's certainly not the best Spanish by any stretch. You know? The best. The best, whatever that means, you know. I mean, you know, we corrupt the language in a lot of ways, and, you know, the, 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 it, you know, it, it, I mean, nobody talks like us. We, we talk in a very particular way. And um, I find it very musical. I find it very funny. Um, I find it very inventive, you know. Um, I love the way Cubans appropriate words and, and they become something else. Um, you know, in the 90s when the word resolver, which means to resolve, mm -hmm. became this word about, you know, just getting it done, you know, just, it became the word, like, we will make it happen. Even though we have nothing here, we will make it happen, you know. Um, it. It was also, it was, I love that they, this word became this way to also talk about determination and about survival and about how, you know, we, we don't need a new word. We're just going to take this word and we're going to do with it whatever we want. You know, I, it's a kind of an audacious thing to do, to, to take the language and very deliberately um, sabotage its original meaning and turn it into something else. And um, I love the playfulness of Cuban Spanish. And so... So it makes you feel like home. Yeah, it's very much home. And it's, and it's not like... Uh, it's not as though my parents were... I and mean, my parents probably spoke better Spanish than the average Cuban. You know, they were the first people in their family to go beyond sixth grade, the first people in their family to go beyond high school. I mean, they overdid it and they both got multiple PhDs because they were overachievers in like every single way. So they, their, their idea was to present as educated people. They weren't, you know, they weren't going out of their way to, to not say cuidado. They were just gonna say cuidado, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, and, but I, I love cuidado. <laughs> you know, I love that that, that happens and that, uh, it's so delicious in your mouth when you say it that way, mm -hmm. um, and and I and I love how wordplay is so integral to communication. Uh, and I mean, you just walk down three blocks in Havana, and you know, I, the, you know the the poetry on the streets and what people say to you is. So fast, and I'm not just talking about, you know, the flirting and stuff like that. I mean, of course, that that's part of the deal, right? But 
but there's so much more that's going on, you know. Yeah. I mean, um, and and uh, and language just. Um, I don't, you know, there's, there's this, uh, there's this terrific little book called Informe contra mi mismo. I don't know if you ever read it. It's, uh, it was written by Eliseo Alberto, mm -hmm. who is the son of Eliseo Diego, the great mm -hmm. Cuban poet, and Eliseo Alberto, who, who is known as Lichi, um, went into exile in Mexico and and lived there most of his life. But this particular book is this very autobiographical novel about how he had been tapped as an informer by the Ministry of the Interior and the Ministry of Culture and mm -hmm. he was he was basically reporting on all his friends and there's this terrific chapter about all the crazy abbreviations of all the 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 many different you know government things you know like the currency exchange you know <laughs> you know, everything has all these like wild new words uh, yeah. that that come into play, and uh, I remember reading this chapter aloud and thinking, "Oh my God, it's it's like a rumba!" You know, mm -hmm. all these letters, the way they they come down. You know, mm -hmm. you could dance to this. You know, <laughs> insanity. Um, yeah. So I I love that that part. I I love. I feel very much a part of. Of, of that sort of cultural stream. But my return happens in conversation. You know, when I'm in a group of Cubans and we're talking in Spanish or we're code switching, I am thrilled beyond measure. You're at home. I am so happy, <laughs> you know. Um, and I'm always, you know, when I'm with people who are English dominant but we're Cuban, I'm always the one who's trying to get us to go into Spanish, you know. Um, Christina, Christina Garcia, who's a really good friend, you know, and I usually, we usually end up talking in English, but it's, uh, it's me who is always sort of taking us back into Spanish and, and uh, stuff like that. But that's one of the reasons why I love being in Cuba. It's less about... You know, it, it, it's it's hearing all that. I mean, I I go to Cuba, and my days are just one long conversation. You know, it's come over for lunch. Seven hours later, I'm still there. We're sitting on the couch, or we're sitting on, you know, out in the terrace, <laughs> and we're todavía estamos hablando. You know, and we're just yakking, and you know, and uh, it's beautiful. I love it. Pues no para hacerte la más larga, but just uh, it, since we're on the topic of translation, uh, I did want to ask you uh, about Juno, Juno Diaz, who's also a friend of yours. Right. Um, and you've translated him. Twice. Uh, right, t twice. Uh, the, the Brief Wonders Life, Oscar Wow, and this is Así es como la pierdes, that mm -hmm. one she translated. Um, I, I, uh, I'm cheating with this question, really. It's not really about translation. Since you've had experience both translating him, but you also have gotten to know him, I wonder what you're... Uh, what you think about or how, uh, what you think about how a community comes to terms with a Me Too movement that involves a favorite author? <laughs> wow. Um, what your thoughts are on that? Yeah. Well, he is a friend, and I love him very much, and uh, and I admire his work, uh, and I think he's he's quite brilliant. Um, I think he's a, a, an exceptional thinker, um, and I think he's a good person. Um, that said, I, I think he behaved badly for many years, uh, and I don't think there's any denying of, of that behavior. Um, and. Uh, I think it has taken him a really long time to get a handle on the consequences of that behavior and uh, the ways that his behavior impacted other people and the damage that he's done. Um, I mean, I find his behavior indefensible. And I think that it's important to 
to say that. You know, it's just absolutely indefensible. Um, that said, um, I, he's not a rapist, he's not a killer, he, uh, he's not someone who has used his influence or power, if you want to call it that, his privilege, his position to hurt other people. In fact, I, I think he's actually been very generous. Uh, you know, he, you know, he was a, an original founder of Vona, Voices of, uh, of Our Nation um, workshop. He, as the editor, the fiction editor at the Boston Review, he's um, published a great number of women, probably more than, than most people. I, uh, I personally know a lot of women writers who have benefited from his support, both in terms of, you know, him, um, you know, giving feedback, making connections for people, but also just literally subsidizing, you know, people going to conferences or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, helping out uh, people with, you know, educational costs and stuff like that. I mean, I I have mercifully never been in that position, but I I'm well aware of the fact that that he has done that. And so I, you know, I, I think he absolutely should be held accountable for his bad behavior and I think he needs to do a lot of work. Um, but I'm, I'm not into pulling his books from the bookstore or the library or, you know, suddenly erasing him from the history of Latino literature in the United States. I think that's ridiculous. First of all, uh, you know, the, you can't erase the influence he's had. And secondly, um, there has to be room, and there has, to, for me, and there has to be a possibility of redemption. People have to be able to screw up and to screw up horribly, to screw up in, in terrible, terrible ways, and to still be able to make amends, you, you know, there has to be room for the possibility of amends. I mean, I think it, it goes well beyond him saying, I'm sorry. And I do think he's not necessarily handled this very well. I think he's gotten defensive. I think, you know, him talking to the media with a lawyer sitting next to him didn't, you know, that was ridiculous. Um, but I also think it was ridiculous to pull him off the Pulitzer board, for example. I mean, his behavior had nothing to do with his presence on the Pulitzer board, and the end result is that we lost a brilliant advocate on the Pulitzer board. It's not like he was replaced by another brilliant Latino or Latina, you know? Mm -hmm. The fact is that, you know, his behavior on the Pulitzer board had nothing whatsoever to do with anything else and they kicked him off and voila, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, he was also kicked off the, the Bona board and kicked off the faculty. And that made a little bit more sense because of course, yes, he was a contributor, but he had also, you know, behaved badly during the, the, the Bona residencies and had exploited his position to, you know, uh, you know, protect his, his bad behavior. But also the Bona people indulged him. And that was, that's, Part of, of I, that, that's one part of the conversation that I find really shocking that so many of us, although I feel like I, you know, resisted a lot of this, but nonetheless, I, I, so many of us, you know, indulged him, turned a blind eye, you know, tolerated his bad behavior because he was Juno Diaz or because, you know, he was doing this or that for us, and then. You know, and we're not taking responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, again, to go back to Vona, right now there are two or three male faculty members whose behavior was just as bad and just as indiscreet, but no one's risen publicly to accuse them, and thus they're still on the board and they're still being indulged and they're still being tolerated. Come on. Mm -hmm. You know, I read somewhere where, you know, a bookstore had pulled his books, they weren't going to sell his books anymore, and I thought, 
Well, who else's books are they not going to then sell? Because mm -hmm. if you're not going to sell Juno because of his bad behavior, do you then do you pull Ted Hughes? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, do Garcia you, Marquez. Yeah, do you pull Garcia Marquez? Oh my God. Yeah, I mean, talk about bad behavior. And renowned with bad behavior, world-renowned bad behavior, outrageous bad behavior. Mm -hmm. um, so, right. you know, what's left in the bookstore of male writers? Uh, come on, mm -hmm. can't do that. Well, so you you mentioned. I mean, you you know Juno Diaz, a friend of yours. You also know uh, Cristina Garcia is a good friend of yours. You go, yeah. you guys go way back. Julia Alvarez is praised Memory Mambo. Juno Diaz is praised Ruins and Days of Awe. Um, you uh, you 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 know you were good friends with uh, Sandra Cisneros. So this is well. this is a little. <laughs> I have to have a past. We have a, we have a long relationship. History, um, <laughs> which you won't have time to talk about today. But um, but w w these these relationships are your literary uh, community of which you're a part right. of. Uh, I wonder how that literary community that you're a part of shapes both Achi Oveja as the writer, but then also Achi Oveja as the person. Um, if you've thought of that. Yeah, I mean, I... You know, I mean, I have friends who are, who are writers who are not Latino, so that also sort of, you know, so, that, yeah. that, that has a lot of, of influence as well. I mean, I, you know, one of my best buds is, you know, Bayou Jakutu, who is this uh, Nigerian-American writer in Chicago, and um, I don't think I, I write much of anything without showing it to him, you know, he's very important to me. Um, you know, and, and, and yeah, Christina and I don't exchange work at all. Wow. You know? We hang out, we gossip, <laughs> we support each other. She's, she's, uh, I've, I've had a really horrible uh, year this year on the personal front. And uh, Christina has been uh, just extraordinary in her love, generosity, friendship. I mean, I, I really think I'd be in miserable shape without her. Um, I mean, I think friendships take, uh, you know, different shape and, uh, you know, they serve different purposes. Uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't talk to Juno with any regularity, but, you know, it, it always feels very, you know, easy when we connect. Um, you know, I'm good friends with uh, uh, Elias Miguel Munoz, um, you know. Uh, this past year, I I got to know Legna Rodriguez Iglesias, and we did exchange some work. And but you know, it was uh, the it, it was a sort of a joyful, um, you know, beginnings of a friendship. And I was very happy to to get to know her, and she turned me on to stuff I hadn't read before, which is always uh, oh my god, it's so delightful, right? when somebody turns you on to something you haven't seen before and you love it. Um, and she's a terrific writer, so it was, uh, it was beautiful to, to encounter this and to talk about the work. I don't know, I mean, uh, you know, different people play different roles in your life, and, and I think that that's true whether they're writers or not. You know, I, um, I had a very long relationship with, with Tani Bruguera, who's not a writer, who's a visual artist, and who um, I think, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, had a tremendous impact on my work, and uh, you know, and you know, for which I'm, I'm very, very grateful. Um, and so uh, these personas intersect a lot. Yeah, you know, I mean, no, it's, you know, the, the, the el, el mundo es un pañuelo incómodo. <laughs> <laughs> What about the future of Latino literary studies? What, how do you, if you were to envision it, how do you see it? You know, where do you see it headed? I have no idea, and and part of that has to do with the fact that though I work in in academia, I'm not an academic, and uh, you know, the only time I've ever been in a Latino studies department was when I taught at DePaul, and um, it was the most extraordinary Latino department I've. I mean, the extraordinary department I've ever been in, period, regardless of, I mean, it was this little oasis <laughs> at DePaul where, you know, I would come in to make copies and, you know, 
John Karam would poke his head out of the office and say, you know, hey, and we'd hug and kiss, and, you know, the secretary would say, oh, Achi's here, and, you know, Lourdes Torres would come up to her office and give me a hug, and it was, it was like some weird, warm, you know, world of Latino wonderfulness. Um, but, you know, it was a small department, and so, uh, you know, there were only like four or five of us, so, it, it, you know, and each of us had our own very specific uh, specialties. So uh, we, we were also very supportive of each other, but we were, nobody was threatening anybody else either. So it was, it was sort of uh, ideal in its way. But I, I don't keep up with, with trends in Latino studies. Well, I, don't. I don't mean like the discipline necessarily, but maybe like the l l Latino literary, mo the movement, you know. That's What's different. That's different. <laughs> yeah. How do you see it? How, how do you see that it's evolved and where do you think it's going? Well, I, there's no question it's evolving. I mean, I think it's, um, uh, you know, there was there was a time when, uh, you know, the, the Latino literature that was being produced was very much immigrant literature. And now I think what's happening is that we're, we're getting second, third, fourth generation mm -hmm. uh, literature. And, uh, and, um, and it still resists uh, assimilation uh, in the same way that African-American literature resist assimilation and I I am so excited about these younger writers I think you know they're kind of unbelievable I I love Eduardo Corral's poetry uh, you know Daniel Borsuski just knocks me out he was here yeah oh my god he's so so good um, you know Cristina Enriquez mm -hmm. is an absolute wonder um, just I mean wow I to teach her yeah, yeah, she's why that book, the the book of unknown Americans. Mm -hmm. Where I can remember, I can remember the title. I mean, wow, that thing was so well constructed and and so beautifully written. Um, so you're hopeful. Oh my God, I am so hopeful. Are you kidding? There, I mean, there's just so much good stuff. I don't have time to read all the the stuff that I want to. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, I'm 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 utterly thrilled by it. The last question I have involves uh, not necessarily politics, in, and not to end, <laughs> not to end <laughs> today or anything like that. But um, you you've mentioned that people always state in Cuba that you were taken from the island and that you were not assigned responsibility for leaving. Um, might that you think ha ha have happened in part? Or, or rather, do you think that that informs a little bit of the melancholic trace that we that we read in your piece for the New York Times when Fidel died? And I was particularly struck by this line. You say, "quote I was born on the island, just as its revolution just sorry just as its revolution shook and inspired the world while splitting its own people in two." End quote. It's just it gives me goosebumps. I feel like this line makes you think about uh, a conflict, how conflictive is Cuban memory epitomizing this mythical figure of Fidel. Um, how he both inspired hate and admiration. You think of your father, and you've mentioned Sometimes this. together. <laughs> yeah, sometimes together. Um, so is it fair to say that Fidel's effect on Cuban lives seems to take a different meaning after death? Um, and it's sort of like two questions, that and then also where do you think Cuban relations with the United States is headed in this era? Are you hopeful about that? Uh, you have to understand that Fidel and, you know, Fidel was in charge of Cuba for more than half of its post-colonial history. So, I mean, he looms large. Uh, you know, history is going to, you know, I think find him a, a very complex and complicated character. I mean, you know, he's that guy who, you know, is out in the world and generous to a fault and has great ideas and is full of energy and you know says all the right things and then he comes home and he beats his wife you know so you know who he is to the world and who he was in Cuba is a very complicated thing you know and I'm not suggesting by any stretch that um, you know the Cuban people hated him because I think that Cuban people have very complex feelings about him um, and uh, that 
even the people who absolutely loathed him also admired him. Um, you know, I, you know, my dad was a really good example. I mean, he just he he absolutely despised him, but he took tremendous pride in the Cuban genius of Fidel in beating the U.S. in all these, you know, strategic ways and, you know, oh, I think un bárbaro, you know, and, you know, it, there's always this, you know, what you can't take away from him is that he was a genius and, um, and this kind of thing. I mean, I, 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 I can't find a comparable figure, a historical figure, that I would say I think he might be treated in this way or like so-and-so. You know, I think he's, uh, he might really be sui generis, you know, I, I don't know. Um, as to relations with the U.S., you know, I think so long as this president uh, is, is in place, there's not going to be good relations with Latin America, period. And, um, you know, Cuba is just part of that larger story. Um, yeah. I, you know, Cuba is also running out of partners. Uh, Cuba has a terrible history of dependency. Cuba doesn't ever like to talk about this. Cubans never want to talk about this. But, you know, after after encounter, you know, with Europe, you know, we have always had dependent relationships. It was, you know, first with the Spanish, you know, then with the Americans, then with the Soviet Union, then with Venezuela. I mean, for that short pre-Hugo Chavez period, when we were on our own, we almost sunk into the sea, you know. We, we've always needed a lopsided deal with somebody where we got the better end of it. Um, and I think there was a certain hope about rekindling that relationship with the US, you know, with Obama, but that, was, that quickly went to hell. And, and right now, you know, I mean, Cuba has, I mean, Venezuela is on fire, and it's very unlikely that Cuba will be able to maintain its um, financial and economic, uh, I don't even want to say stability because it hasn't been stable, but it's, you know, it's, it's possibility, uh, you know, as, as Venezuela sort of crashes and burns. So what, you know, what can Cuba do? What, you know, what changes can it make? Uh, I think it, it requires a wholesale rethinking of who we are. And I'm not suggesting that, that Cuba needs to have some sort of plan of self-subsistence, self-sustainment, because yeah. I don't think there's a single country in the world, the United States included, who can do that. That kind of, you know, isolationism doesn't work. Um, Maybe new alliances? But I think Cuba needs, I think Cuba needs new alliances and I think Cuba needs a rethinking of, 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 of its economy. Um, and, it, and I'm not just saying that the economy needs to open up. I think Cuba has made bad investments, you know. Um, it, it stuck to sugar for a gazillion years, long after sugar was no longer a viable crop. Mm -hmm. you, know, it, yeah. it, 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 you know, it has stuck to tobacco, um, you know, long after, the, uh, you know, that has, I mean, it's, it was never a, a, a particularly great tobacco producing country, but it, it's, it's like a national symbol, you know, we have to have tobacco, we have to have sugar, we have to have, um, you know, cafe. But and none of those things really work. And on the other, and, and then there's the problem of tourism. And I say the problem of tourism because um, while tourism solves some of the immediate economic problems because there is an immediate infusion of cash without having to produce product. Um, tourism also teaches an acquiescence that is contrary to 
a lot of the, the national spirit, and which is another way of, 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 of sort of going back into colonial mindset. And, uh, and I find that to be tragic. You know, Cuba's got to figure some other way of doing things. I don't, I don't know what it is that Cuba can do. Maybe it's biotech. Maybe you know, it's something else. But it, it, nothing from the past has worked. So time to rethink, rethink the rethink, yeah, rethink the system. And lastly, what moves Achi Ovejas, other than estando en casa con los tuyos? You like it when you talk about Cuba and AR, like, you know, the language. What moves Achi Ovejas? God, I don't know. I mean, I, there are many things I love, and that love moves me. Uh, you know, a good book moves me. Uh, a great rum moves me. <laughs> <laughs> Conversations till dawn move me. Uh, music moves me. Um, my friends, I'm very grateful. I, especially this past year, I'm very, very grateful for my friends. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. This was, uh, uh, yeah. this was really thank great. You. These are wonderful Appreciate questions. It. Oh, thank you. No, thank you so much for being here and look forward to your lecture and also look forward to your future which work, which we did talk about here. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> what we've talked about before, so. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>